and Drew Tooney, and I would love to personally invite you to Hallelujah Side Baptist Church. We are a loving, Christ-centered church located at 119 Valley Street in Old North Dayton. We are a local, independent, Baptist body of Christ, taking the gospel to our beloved city of Dayton, whose sole purpose is to bring glory to God in all that we do, standing alone on our sole authority of faith and practice, the King James Bible. We have a children's and adult Sunday school hour that starts at 10 a.m. We have a sanctified worship service that starts at 11 a.m. Our midweek prayer meeting starts at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening. We also have a nursery available for children three and under during both services. For more information, visit us at hsbc-dayton.com. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. God bless you. So we are going to continue, or we're going to close and finish, uh, the, the office of deacon. So as we've said over the last few weeks, there are two offices in the New Testament church. One of them is the office of pastor, the other is office of deacon. <clears throat> it's an amazing thing because a lot of times in corporations across the country or companies, when you think of company or corporate officers, you think of people that are calling the shots, that are running the show, and there's a lot of churches whose pastors and deacons are uh, filling a pot, spot in the corporation. <clears throat> in God's kingdom, it's not like that. Uh, both the office of pastor and office of deacon are offices for people to serve and he's calling them to serve beyond and beyond themselves and the deacon certainly fills that and it's not so that the members of the church don't have to do anything it's to be an example so the members will also be people of service because the New Testament church is that of service for doing for people and not expecting anything in return uh, it's a cool thing most times when you do something for somebody in this world uh, they're waiting for, okay, how am I going to pay him back? It's kind of a human nature. Uh, the church is different. We do for people because Christ did for us, and we don't expect anything in return. Um, no, we shouldn't expect anything in return. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 6. We went over the qualifications last week. <clears throat> Acts chapter 6. If somebody could get there and read verses 1 through 4 for me. Acts chapter 6, 1 through 4. Uh, at chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of Grecians. Grecians. Oh, oh, multiplied, there arose a multi oh, okay, a Grecians against the Hebrews because their widow widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, breaketh brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and with wisdoms, wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to pray and to ministry of the word. Okay, so here's an interesting thing. You have a division in the church. There's, a, there's murmuring or complaining. I know that never happens in the church. No one ever complains in God's church. But back in those days, apparently they did. And what you had was Grecians and Hebrews. They were different. They were different people groups. They did not see the world the same way. And the Grecians thought that the widows were being neglected in the daily minister, ministering of the church. Now here's the thing. What could have happened was the apostles could have said, we don't have time for this. We need to minister, so we're going to worry about prayer and the Holy Bible and, and, and the scriptures and, and how to articulate that. And we're going to be in prayer and that's what we're supposed to do. And they were right. But if they would have ignored the issue in the church between the Hebrews and the Grecians, or would, if you're here today and you're not a Hebrew, you're a Gentile. So if they would have ignored that, uh, pretty soon that's going to get really ugly. Because it's a legitimate need. And it's very important to have men in the church, and this is usually the pastors, that are attending to 
the spiritual needs of the flock. That's the number one priority. It is also important, though, I think you're all physical. You all have bodies. You have physical needs. You have needs uh, that are important to you that are based on secular things, basically time-driven. You have relationships that are important to you. The church also needs to address those things. It's funny because if you ever look at Jesus when he would do ministry, um, do you remember the times that he was teaching and preaching and there was multiples, uh, multitudes of people and he would feed them? Why would he do that? To take care of their personal needs? Yeah. They were hungry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's funny because a lot of times we get very spiritual and all this stuff. They were hungry. So what did he do? He fed them. So we're a New Testament church. If we have hunger in our community, what should we do? Feed them. Yeah. Feed them. Now, here's the beautiful thing about being a Baptist minister. I will feed you, but if you let me in your house to feed you, I'm going to tell you the gospel. But it's easy to tell someone the gospel if their belly's full. Because, hey, they brought me um, go, that Kroger's fried chicken. That's good stuff. Go get you some fried chicken and take it. Oh, man. So the, this, what happened was there was a need that rose in the church. And so do you think that God missed this? Because they didn't start out having deacons. This happens later. Jesus never spoke of deacons. Did he miss it? So why do you think it happened this way? Wasn't needed till then. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So he's already kind of setting a foundation for it. Okay. So this this er, this thing came up. Now you got to remember this church at Jerusalem. It was a little bigger than our church. And. Um, the amazing thing about that church at Jerusalem, there's thousands of them, and there's all kinds of people groups. So you have Gentiles, uh, the Roman Empire is huge, so you have all these cultures of people coming together. And the, the, the apostles were all Hebrew, okay? Um, I'm not sure, I know there's a couple places in the Bible where Peter wasn't always uh, on board with the Gentile thing. You know, he did, Paul had to withstand him to his face. He was, a, he was associated with that people group. Now, whether he was or wasn't in this situation, I'm sure the, the Gentiles would view this as all they care is about the Hebrews. That never happens in our churches, right? You know, we have white churches, we have black churches, we have Korean churches. How about just a church that honors God? It doesn't matter what, you know? Amen. Amen. It don't matter. And this is why they had here. But they, they had an issue that came up, and someone was feeling slighted. And when someone feels slighted in the church, you need to go to them and find out why. Uh, well, they're just complaining. Go out and find out why. And here's what happens, and, and, and I really believe this. God could have set this all up. Okay, you got all, you're going to have to get deacons. You're going to have to do this. He gives the church a responsibility to take care of their own. What's that mean? They're self-governing. And God gave us the power to do that. And they make a great decision. So they said, you know what we're going to do? Uh, the brethren looked out, the, the apostles among you and and they tell the church pick you seven guys out honest report we read the qualifications last week full of the holy ghost and wisdom means they're saved means they're they're wise they make good decisions they can't be flying by the seat of their pants guys they can't be emotional guys they can't be church dividers where you know what i like peter more than i like james or john so y'all follow him can't have that. I like Pastor Andrew more than I like Pastor Scott. We know that ain't true because I'm much more lovable than he is. But, <laughs> but there can't be division because this is about Jesus Christ. It ain't about my way or his way. We're to do things God's way. And then as we would, uh, as a church, as we go along and, and we appoint a deacon he, at our own church, he is to be of like mind with the pastors. It's not a, it's not a competition. It's not a uh, political thing. It's about doing what God wants. So the pastor needs uh, the deacons in the church and is to be a servant of both the pastor and the people. Here's the thing. That doesn't set well with people. Because what, to be part of the New Testament church, sacrifice is required. He requires you to give of yourself. He requires you to support other people. He requires you to do it when it's not convenient for you. Now here's the amazing thing. He blesses you for that attitude. 
So who is a good example of someone that was willing to sacrifice on the behalf of others at all costs? Good answer. How many of the apostles were martyred that we know of? Now the Bible didn't say, all, but historically. How, all but one. John died of, he was persecuted, but it, it sounded like he died of a ripe old age, of old age. So what you have is a beautiful picture of these apostles following in, the, in Jesus Christ to the point that they would sacrifice even their own lives, their physical lives. And then if you read the church history, through the trail of blood or some of these churches, you will see how brave men of the church continued, and women, to give their lives for the, for the furtherment of the gospel. Now here's what happens. Those of you that aren't married, a good marriage, this is how this works. If you're willing to give of yourself and sacrifice for your wife, she's going to be loyal to you unless she's just crazy. Okay? But godly women, when a man's willing to sacrifice of themselves for the good of the family, naturally, man, they, I love him. And the church is the same way, the bride of Christ. Christ gave himself for the church. So in this, this uh, if we talk about deacons and pastors in this act of service, if you have people that aren't stirring their pot, but the men of the church that are filled these offices are here because they love you and they're willing to sacrifice, what should happen is the people of that church should really love him. I mean, he's going to be there for me. Um, it's funny, the pastors that I remember most in my life as having an impact on me were all very giving men. The ones that impacted me the most. Deacons, too. I have deacons in my life that impacted me the most. <clears throat> and here's what's the crazy thing about them. They didn't tickle my ears. They told me the truth even if I was doing something contrary to, and you know what, I needed to hear it, and they told me the truth, because not because it was an easy thing, because they loved me. You ever have a really good friend that, he don't answer, you ever have a really good friend that just told you whatever you wanted to hear, but behind your back they told, you know, they were just, pep, 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 pep. good friends that love you, tell you the truth, whether you're ready to hear it or not, because they care about you. And what they end up doing is a lot of times they'll go back to you because they know that you'll tell them the truth about things. Sometimes with, with, with friends of mine or people in the church, when they've told me things, I've even asked them, do you want me to respond or do you want me to just listen? That's a smart man. Right and there. sometimes, you know what they say? Just listen. Sometimes it's just that. Just someone that loves you enough that will just listen. And then if you need to give them a response, God will open them. And then sometimes they'll ask you, say, what's your, it's funny. So sometimes at the end of the conversation, so what's your response? Well, you told me just to listen. Well, no, I want to know, you know. So, and, and deacons are in part of this. So the deacons are an act of, of work in the ministry. They, uh, they should visit the sick. They should care for the bereaved. They, they should head off problems when they arise, when they, when they see them arise. And they need to take care of business, basically, um, under the supervision of the pastor. And the generally, they are a servant of the pastor and of, of the other people that we're all servants. Right. Deacons are not pastors' private slaves, by the way. Ooh. It's not like, it was cool. When I was a deacon, Pastor Andrew never said, hey, Scott, get out there and get salt down on the ground and shovel the driveway and all that. You know, he didn't treat me as a slave. Um, I'm glad. Uh, deacons are not private slaves. They are partners in the ministry of God, serving a different place. We are all um, under the ownership of God. So you as a member of this church are not under the ownership of Pastor Andrew. You're not under the ownership of me. You're under our leadership. We don't control you. The Holy Spirit does. Jesus Christ is the head of this church. Um, myself or Pastor Andrew could go out and get hit by a bus tomorrow. You know what? His church is going to continue to go on. He does not need us to continue his work. He did pretty good without me for 2,000 and some odd years. I don't think he really, he needs me. So he made this available to me to bless me. So we find out that the primary leadership role has been, um, is vested in the office of pastor. Uh, somebody could read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 for me. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Okay, now jump down and read verse 17. 
Hebrews chapter 13. Obey them that have the rule over you and, sub and submit yourself, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Okay, so that was actually the verse I wanted. I gave you the wrong one the first time. <laughs> That's what happens, Pastor Andrew. When you go off memory, you quote the wrong scripture. That's what happens. So there's a primary leadership in the church, and it was been, it's, it's in the office of pastor. And the pastor to lead as Jesus Christ would direct them to lead. So how do you know if the pastor is doing the right thing? What is it that you can go to to find out yeah, what they're saying is right? Bible. Bible. So is there an onus on the church membership to know their Bible? Here's the beautiful thing about a Christian that's been in the work a long time that studies their Bible. Have you ever heard a preacher say something and it strikes you? That's not right. Because it's, it's important that the membership of the church understands the scriptures because, you know what it does? It makes us study harder. We better make sure we're right. Not just to be accountable to you, but to be accountable to God. I want to be right because I'm accountable to him. I don't want to mess this up. And what happens with men and deacons are in this thing too, when they're in position and a lot of people see them, it's very easy for us to get caught up in our own pride and create our own agenda. All of us. I know that doesn't happen in our politics, right? It happens in our churches. It happens in Baptist churches. Hey, for you to be a member of the church, you need to look like me. Hey, you need to cut your hair. Hey, you've got tattoos, you don't fit in. I don't set the agenda. And there are things personally I don't like from my upbringing, from things I think, well, um, I'm not going to get on the tattoo thing because some people have tattoos and some things don't. We can talk about that later. But I'm certainly not going to shut the door to someone that has tattoos. They can be tattooed up. And if I turn away from them and they don't know Christ, how do you think that's going to stand for me when I stand before God? Well, Lord, they have tattoos. Who did Jesus go see? You can't go see that Samaritan woman. She ain't like us. So what does our churches do now? They're not like us. It happens too often. And I'll pick on Baptists. It happens too often in Baptist churches where they turn a blind eye to people that are in need because they don't look like we look. They don't sing the right hymns. That guy wore a baseball hat in the sanctuary. How dare him? You ever think... Maybe he didn't know any better. And maybe he does know better. He knows better than me than being Judge Miller. Somebody's got a baseball hat on. Now, if somebody had an Ohio State hat on, I'd understand why you want to take it off. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> so this leadership, and I kind of got off on a tangent a little bit, but it's trying to take into consideration we are to run the Lord's church under his guidance. Right. Now, does it mean that we turn a blind eye to sin? No. I've said this, and it shocks people sometimes. Is our church all inviting to everybody? No. If somebody comes in and has problems and they're in sin, we're going to try to help them. But if they want to try to bring the sin into the church to derail people, that's a leadership thing like, hey, that can't happen. We don't condone. But, but in love and explain to them why. Homosexuality, we're not going to condone that. God doesn't. It's really easy. Why don't you condone it? But God doesn't condone it. And, that's, and, and it's that black and white. So the people in the pews, they need the deacons as well. They... They uh, take time to serve the church. They need to be there for them when they need help. Um, they need to look after the welfare of the people in the church to, to uh, have the power to maintain the peace and the harmony in the church. Avoid being caught up in cliques. You ever see those in churches? The bigger the church, the more the cliques. We saw it in youth group. You had little groups of kids that would hang. Usually it was the church kids. They would hang out. Some outsider came that wasn't part of the, this is great, that wasn't part of the church, they weren't part of the clique. Hey, guys, what's the thing McFly? You know, wake up. They're placed over, the Bible says in Acts chapter 6, verse 3, we need to place him over this business. It refers to the business of ministering to people's physical needs. Um, so we're going to see some of the people they, they serve. So go back to uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Somebody can read that for me, please. And the word of God increases, and the number of the disciples multitude in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obtained, obtained? 
Okay, notice what he says there. The deacons, and it's going through, and we're about to get into Stephen and, and one of the, the early deacons, but it, it showed that, that, that the deacons were to fight for the saints. It's funny, they're almost like warriors. And the deacon had the responsibility to do everything in his power to help the church grow. And it's funny because part of the church's growth is dependent upon helping people with their physical needs. When you're sick and you don't feel well, and I'm not a person that likes a lot of visitors when I'm sick, but when I was sick recently, I did like the little treats that showed up at my door. It, it warmed my heart. It made, because, and the text messages I got. You know why? Because it, it made me feel loved. And you feel rotten. And you feel horrible. And it's funny because a lot of times, I have, when I've been in, in situations of health issues and stuff, my church family has reached out much more in love than my blood family has. It's amazing how many people in my church family know me better than my blood family does. Because you know why? It takes time to get to know somebody. You have to put an effort into that. And that's a great job of the deacon. He can fight for the saints. He can uh, help the church growth by doing that. He can um, thank God for deacons who are like bulldogs. Uh, there was one at Crestview that didn't leave me alone. And I gave him every excuse not to serve I could possibly do. And that bulldog wouldn't leave me alone. He made me mad because he was so honest about things. I told him about how I used to get hurt in church. They did this to me. And he looked me in the eye and goes, don't you think it's about time you got over that? That's Boy, did he make me mad. I, I was smoke coming out of my ears. You know what I needed to hear? He was right. It was about time I got over that. Get back, get, get busy what God's called you to do. And he was a bulldog. Uh, they, it's funny. I think When you think of a bulldog, you think of a dog sniffing stuff. You know, They sniff out problems that could harm the pastor or the church. You know why? And they take a stand against it. They shouldn't be wishy-washy. Take a stand against it. Somebody read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9 for me, please. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9. <coughs> 3, verse 9. Yes. The <laughs> and then also, I'm going to read one that goes along. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 says this. And the things that thou hast heard among, uh, heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So not only do they fight for the saints, but I think according to those scriptures, uh, they're in a great position to fight for the truth of the scriptures. Um, and we've already kind of touched on this, but deacon, I believe, must be active in the ministry of the word of God. They need to be men of the Bible. They need to be steadfast in their study and, and, and and they should be able to articulate. Doesn't necessarily mean they're getting up and leading teach. I mean, a lot of times we have te the deacons are all the Sunday school teachers. But what it does mean is they contend for the faith. They will fight for the scriptures. They will fight for the word of God. And along with the pastor, they can guard against doctrinal, the doctrinal purity of the church. It's good to have those extra ears. Hey, so-and-so is in the Sunday school class. They're teaching that you've got to work for your salvation and be baptized to go to heaven. Well, we need to hear about that before half the church believes that. Um, and deacons can help you in that in that regard. So now I'll go back to Acts chapter 6. Verse 8 says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And now go down to verse 9. Then those uh, uh, certain of the synagogue, which were called in the synagogue the Libertines and Cyrenians, and exalted, say that again, it's easy for me to say. Do you ever read, look at something you read before and your mind just goes blank? What she said. <laughs> and of them, uh, uh, Cecilia and Asia, and disputing with Stephen. All right. So, Stephen, a man full of grace and honor and full of the Holy Spirit, he gets up. And he starts to contend with these religious groups, Jewish groups. And they decide to uh, take um, disregard what he's saying. They're going to dispute with him. And he stirred up the people. Down in verse 12 it says, And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. So they go out and they stir up the people. They get out in the crowd. Hey, the Stephen guy. You know what, he, you know what Stephen was telling them? 
You murdered your, your Savior. You murdered your Messiah. And he starts giving a Jewish history. And it was evil. And in some places you read the Bible, it talks about pricking men's hearts and they repented. Well, it pricked their heart, but didn't prick their heart in a way to where they repented. And the Bible says that they acted in one accord like a bunch of dogs go after him, demonically possessed, going after him. So what we find here that Stephen, not only was he the type, I think, that would fight for the scriptures and fight for the saints of God, you know what? He was fighting for sinners. Regardless of the outcome, he was not going to be quiet. Regardless of the numbers against him, he was not going to be quiet. <clears throat> we live in a, a country now that if the majority rules on something, that, okay, that must be right. We forget that the minority has a voice in this country. Why Congress has set up, you know, people don't want you to study the history of this country. <clears throat> there was a voice of one here. And all the people were dead set, we're going to shut him up. But the one that this deacon had the approval of was God himself. I'd rather be on the minority and have his approval and be part of the majority and everybody slap me on back and say, good job, Scott. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Like that. <laughs> Town effects. He goes on. Notice what they do in verse number 13. They set up false witnesses which said, this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and to the law. For we have heard him saying that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Which These are all lies, by the way. Jesus never changed any of their customs. And their customs did not come from Moses. Notice the word, customs. You ought to go back and read what the Old Testament law was and what the Pharisees would have these people doing. Sounds like a religious disaster. And all that sat in the uh, council looked steadfastly on him and saw his face. It had been the, the face of an angel. So they're lying about the guy. He's saying this. You ever had that happen to you? Sam said this about me. Whatever it is what people do, we take the truth and we spin it to make it favorable to us. They wanted him shut up. And he was a deacon of the church. Stephen was going to fight for sinners. Notice that these first deacons were very active in spreading the gospel. In fact, Stephen is a preaching deacon. He's getting up and preaching. And he also becomes the first martyr of the Christian era. He preached with a boldness that causes his enemies to attack him. So it goes on, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but going in chapter 7, he starts to go through a historical account of Egypt, going all the way back to the time of Abraham, to Joseph being sold in slavery, and, and Moses, and, and the murmuring, and, and all these things that was going on until it gets down to chapter 8, or towards the, uh, chapter 7, excuse me, at the end of chapter 7, and verse number 51. He gives you stiff neck and uncircumcised in the heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets did not your fathers pers uh, persecuted and have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Basically, he says, your fathers killed the prophets. That sound familiar? Jesus said the same thing. Your fathers killed the prophets. The only true men of God that he sent to tell you about a coming Messiah, you murdered them. Your, your ancestors did. So you would, the apple don't fall from, far from the tree. Look what happens. Who you have received the law by disposition of angels and had not kept it. Hey, the Jewish people, you received the law from angels. You've got something the Gentiles didn't have. You know who the, you knew who Jesus was. That, that's the thing. They rejected him knowing full well who he was. When they heard these things, oh, it says, they cut to the heart and they gnashed upon him with their teeth. They grab Stephen and they start to gnash upon him with their teeth. Yeah. Sound demonic, don't they? Mm -hmm. But being full of the Holy Ghost, now what do you think if you're Stephen you're going to do? Run. Run. Here's what people do that are filled with the Holy Spirit and they're willing to fight for sinners, even sinners that would kill them. The reason that the sinners don't kill certain people in this country today is because they go to jail for it. But if there was laws and all of a sudden, hey, us haters, the same thing would happen. They're not nice. It's, it's, we don't live in a nice society. 
But being he full of the Holy Ghost, he looked up steadfastly in heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. I've explained this last week, but just for a minute, and in verse 56, read this, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. If you study anywhere in the Bible, it talks about Jesus sitting down at the right hand of God, sitting down at the right hand of God, sitting down at the right hand of God. He is so pleased with Stephen and his stance for the truth and the gospel against all his adversaries, Jesus stands out of his throne to greet him. I want to be in the minority. And I don't know how this happened. I've been in a lot of situations where I've been with people that were about to die that were Christians. And I've been with people that weren't. There's a difference. I've talked to people that were waiting Jesus Christ to come get them, basically. And they're filled with the Spirit. And I walk out of there uplifted because you don't want them ready to go. And I've been with people that were dead scared of dying because they didn't know Jesus. And you can try to reason that out in your mind. I've been there. I've seen it. I'm an eyewitness of it. Stephen was one of those. Jesus Christ gets up and greets him. Notice what they do in verse number 57. Then they cried with a loud voice and uh, stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying and he called upon God saying Lord Jesus receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice Lord lay not this sin at their charge and when he had said this he fell asleep. His last words were fighting for the sinners. Did God answer his prayer? Do you notice who they laid the coats at? One of the conspirators. Lord lay not this sin at their charge fellow named Saul. You know him as Paul. Paul persecuted the church. He was responsible for conspiring to murder Stephen. Stephen's last words were laid not this sin in this charge and not long after this Paul is converted. Saul is converted. His name is changed to Paul and I'm pretty sure that all of us are here today because of Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. I think you're all Gentiles. You could probably trace it back to, to Paul and, and his crew. He fought for the sinners. He fought for a sinner named Saul. And then if you want to read something really cool, that deacon. It's funny. It wasn't only the apostles. That deacon was the one praying for that religious zealot. Paul was a very, Saul was a very religious man. He was a murderer. We don't have that happen in our country, do we? How many of the TV, perspi- uh, what do they call them? Yeah. Heath and I were talking about this yesterday. Send me so much money and God will triple it for you and put it in your bank account. I need the fuel. Gas is going up. I need fuel for my private jet and all that kind of jazz. So you've got this and the world steeps world religion and Jesus Christ on these people they see on TV. They're the murderers he's talking about in the Bible. They're stealing money from widows. How many people that don't have money are sending these creeps money God, though, you believe people should give to the church? Yeah. But don't give it to some uh, snake oil salesman. And give to the church what God puts on your heart to give. He can take care of it. If you're a saved child of God, he's going to put on your heart what to give. He just is. I don't have to tell you. But the snake oil salesmen out there, the carnies, have a show that they put up. That's what Saul was. He was a carny. He was into the religious thing. He was... Look at the robes I've got on. And this Jesus fella is messing things up. I'm going to put an end to it. I don't know what my, my prayer might have been. You know what, Lord, take them all out. Stephen's prayer is a deacon of the church, a faithful man looking at the needs of the church and the physical needs of the church and sharing the gospel was don't let this sin on their, don't, don't put this sin on their account. Same thing Jesus down the, yeah, you see, good point. You see a similarity? Hey, this guy looks a lot like this Jesus character. So what's, what's going to happen to the deacons of the church? They're like Stephen. They're gonna get, they might get stoned. I don't know. They're going to run into some problems. Because what you're going to do, same way with the pastor, same way with a, a, a member of the New Testament church, with the political environment of our country right now, you're going to run into problems because the things that we preach and teach and believe in does not line up with a world system that's corrupt and evil. 
I got news for you. The Democrats have an agenda, but before you get excited, so do the Republicans. The only organization, and this is the way it should be, the New Testament church that's founded upon the gospel, that's founded upon Jesus Christ, that has two ordinances. We practice one of them today. Lord's Supper, the other one's baptism. They have two offices, deacon and pastor. The deacon and pastor are to be servants of the people and, the pa and, and servants of each other, to show a servitude among each other, to preach the gospel and to tell people the good news about Jesus Christ until he returns again. That's not going to be received well. And here's what should happen. The louder they scream, you haters, the louder we should scream back. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Save them. You know, it's funny. You said that that's an interesting point. They're doing what their father does. I believe they're doing what they think is right. I believe that they're so programmed that they look at people like us, or myself in particular, and they believe, they believe I'm a hater. They're programmed that way. Now, here's what's crazy. I've met a lot of people on these streets that I do not see eye to eye with. Religiously, their political views, um, where their heart's at, the, uh, homosexuality, um, gender. I can't even begin on that because I can't figure it out. <coughs> and I totally detest what they believe in. I have never met one I hated so much I wanted to kill them or harm them. Look at the story of Stephen. If you're here today and you're a child of God and you stand for this, there are people here that want to hurt you. They want to discredit you. They want to take your money from you. Redistribute the wealth. You know, that's always worked out in history. Yeah, Bible thumper. I always like to be called a Bible thumper. I think that's a compliment. I'm crazy. He was willing to fight for sinners. Notice that these first deacons were very active in spreading the gospel. In fact, Stephen, he was a preaching deacon. The first martyrs, I said, he preached with boldness that caused his enemies to attack him. There's another deacon, his name was Philip, and he carried on a tradition that was instrumental in a great revival in Samaria. And then you read his story. Uh, Stephen uh, was not too busy to also take time to minister to individuals as well. Even though they, they did teach and they carried the gospel, the office of deacon's primary focus was the physical needs of the people in the church. It's funny because we kind of get away. Crestview did this, and it was a blessing to me. The deacons did a lot about taking care of widows. I'm a, here's a side note. This ain't in the notes, but I like going, you know, you know me. I'll chase a rabbit wherever it'll go. <clears throat> we live in a society now that it's a lot of uh, give or take, 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 but don't want to give back, you know. What can I get? What can I get when I get it? <clears throat> and a lot of people will look to churches for that. Feed me. Uh, Robin's a church secretary. The church she used to work at was called Ailey, and it was at the top of the phone book, and at the beginning of each month, she would get phone calls, because they would go, hey, do you pay electric bills? Do you pay this? Do you pay that? So in the Bible, what you see is a very a big onus on the church and to take care of widows and orphans, and you see that. There's a, a people group, a gender, that he doesn't talk about. You know what that gender is? Men. Widows, orphans. You know why? God expects men to work and take care of widows and orphans. We have been given an onus to be the, the primary breadwinner in the household. And it all, God's plan always goes to the give. Pastor Burke in our old church says, you give to get, to give, to get, to give, to get, to give. And he says, always in on the give. And it's funny, the deacons, they didn't say, hey, you know what? <clears throat> Go take care of Sam, because he's, you know, not, not mean that we don't support our brothers in Christ. But it doesn't say, hey, go, it doesn't put Sam in the same category as widows. Someone that's destitute. You know what the Lord will say? Well, Sam can work. <laughs> it just be. The Apostle Paul, there's another scripture, you can read this later. It was talking about this within the church. It was talking about people not willing to work. You know what Paul said? This is hate speech, but okay, tie yourselves down. <clears throat> Do you know what Paul said? If they don't work, what did he say? They don't eat. So, wait a minute, Scott. This is getting personal. <laughs> so what's Jesus expect? He expects his people to work. To have a work ethic. Not to be lazy. You should be, if you're an employee here, you should be the best employee you can possibly be, not to honor your company, but to honor God. 
You should have the same work ethic in the church. Deacons and pastors should lead that. We should never, the deacon of the church, the pastor of the church, should never ask people in the church to do anything that we're not willing to do ourselves. I think both pastors of this church just ran the vacuum cleaner. And then uh, Bonnie comes and tells us what we missed. It's here. It's there. <clears throat> the early deacons had a standard. Uh, Philip, going back to him, was an interesting story. So he'd gone out, was part of a, a, a um, missionary work in Samaria. He was called away. I'm going to tell you the story. You can read it later. It's in the book of Acts. <clears throat> to go to the desert. Think about this. I, I, and this shows the man of faith that he was. Things are going really good here, Lord. Where, what is it? Where do you want me to go? Go to the desert. There's nobody there. Yeah, go to the desert. So when the Lord calls you to go to the desert, you know what you should do? Go to the desert. There's an Ethiopian. He's sitting there and he's reading Isaiah chapter 53, and he's not understanding it. And Steve or uh, Philip asks him, "Do you understand what you read? How can I but some man guide me?" So Philip opens up Isaiah 53 to him and shows him as talking about the Messiah. Jesus Christ, who was crucified, the Ethiopian gets saved, Philip baptized him. He was one of the first deacons of the church. You see a common ground here. They, they were an instrumental part of that early church, and the office of deacons is an instrumental part of the church today. They had a standard that they lived by, a sacrifice of work. They had a work ethic about them. They would stand up for the truth. They didn't care about what the majority said. They cared, about what, they cared about the approval of God. Can you imagine standing up or being stoned? I don't, I have the idea of being stoned to death really hurts. But Jesus appears to you and you see him standing up with his arms open wide to accept you. I bet the stones don't hurt as bad anymore. There's an old song that says, uh, everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die. I'm that guy. But do you know what I know? I know when it's my time There'll be a savior with his arms open wide, welcoming me in. And my goal is for him to welcome me and say, you know what, you did a good job for me. So how do you attain that? Read about these stories about these deacons. They were faithful to God. And here's the thing. Being faithful to God made them faithful to their church. Faithful to God's always first. You'll be, if you're faithful to God, you'll be faithful to your wife. It always starts with him. If you're faithful to God, you'll be faithful to your church. If you're faithful to God, you're faithful in your job. If you're faithful to God, you'll have a sense of morality that's of God and not of the world. Things become very black and white to you. It doesn't mean that, hey, I'm going to criticize this person for what they're doing. It means I'm not going to get involved in that. And here's what's amazing about what God does. You don't have to say a lot sometimes. He'll use your lifestyle to convict other people. Sam and I were talking before about the times that Jesus, it takes me a lot of words to explain myself. It was amazing what Jesus did. You ever notice how few words he used to get a point across? And he was like, they were done. Uh, Pastor Anderson been preaching out of the book of Matthew. How many times in a short words the Pharisees were just cut off and done? And I love some of the things that he said. The woman that was caught in sin and adultery and, and they're sitting there and they're telling Jesus the law and we should stone her and, and Jesus is doodling in the sand. I was sharing this with Sam and he gets up and I, to me, I look at it this way. He looks at these, these men that are there and he's almost like, so what, you're still here? You're excused. Yeah, I mean, it was like um, they were interpreting the law to the lawgiver, which is really funny. I told Sam, I go, he's the one in the hand of the tablets to Moses. He's the one that wrote them with his finger and these guys are telling him how it is. So finally he excuses them and and once again, I mean, like I said, the wisdom, uh, the one among you without sin cast the first stone, uh, throws the stones down and all leave, which actually what that meant, they were all caught in adultery, or they were all guilty probably of adultery, and probably there was multiple of them that was guilty of it with her, I would imagine. I would imagine the guy that was caught with her, you know, he wasn't to be found. He might have been one with a rock in his hand, who knows, but you can speculate on this all day. But in the very few words he, he asked, where are your accusers? She goes, there are none. And Jesus says, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. So very simplistic, the things that he taught, we make them very complicated. So what's the Lord trying to say? Well, you're caught up in sin. I've forgiven you. Don't go back to that lifestyle anymore. There's nothing really deep about that. It's very, it's, you know what? You don't, have to have a, you don't have to have a Bible degree to understand what he said. I've forgiven you. You're clean. You're washed. Don't go back to your lifestyle anymore. And these deacons would stand up for this, and man, they, would, they, they, they suffered for it. But they stood firm. 
And the deacon office, this, that same standard, after all these years, need it, needs to be held and respected in the church today, just like it was 2,000 years ago. They must have a, a passion for souls. I really believe this. The deacons need to have, not only for the physical needs of the church, but they need to have a passion for the souls of people. And when you have a passion for the souls of people, it means you care about them. Even people that you don't like, well, preacher, are there people you don't like? You better believe it. There are people that get on my last nerve. And pretty soon I have a passion for their souls, and I find myself praying for them. Yep. Now, I would tell you that I say, I mean, I'm not going to pray for them, the Lord. I don't, I don't do that. <clears throat> but what's amazing is how God starts pointing out things to me that aren't that attractive. And how could there have been somebody along the line that looked past my faults and still prayed and loved me? And I, you know, I'm prideful. Well, of course not. I'm lovable and everybody loves me. Of course, you know, he's so there ready to throw up. He's known me for 45 years. Of course not. Well, when you have a passion for souls, you begin to pray for them. You begin to do for them. And all the years I have discipled people and I would think that, man, this person is just a wreck. I don't want any part of it. And God sends them to me. And I learned that, well, oh, wait a minute. I helped them, but he was teaching me something too. And here's what he taught me. Scott, you were unlovable, and I loved you anyway, so I send people that seem unlovable because I expect you to love them too. And then what does he do? He starts to show them parts of them that you just fall in love with. Their personality. Their, you know, How many people you met was just irritating? You get to know them. Their sarcasm actually becomes funny. It's like, funny you know I remember the first time I met Sam I thought what a train wreck <laughs> and, Thank you. and I appreciate he's funny he, he he Andrew knows this he was his roommate Sam's funny I mean there's things he says it's like and he throws grenade jokes you know what that is you do this and you sit there and he walks away and you're like oh ah, because the grenade goes off you just finally get it that's a grenade joke it's biblical the standard's high for the office of deacon. If a person desires the office and the church wants them, they need to understand it's a, it's a high calling. There's two, two offices in the church, pastor and deacon, biblical offices. No. They're very important. I'm thankful for all the people that serve in the church, but there are two positions of service. I like to say that. Service in the church that are ordained in the scriptures. It doesn't mean that other people don't serve in churches that may not you know, mentioned in the Bible. These are special things set out from a service, leadership, and attending to the, the spiritual and physical needs of the church. And apparently it was important. The rewards, I think, are amazing. Deacons are needed as much today as they were 2,000 years ago. They are an important part of the church. Deacons that are sold out for Christ. I've been in a few churches where the deacons got saved. I've told my dad once, if a Baptist deacon gets saved, anybody could. But I mean, you know, you need to be careful. You need to examine them. They need to examine themselves. We took a communion, Lord's Supper, this morning. We need to examine ourselves. Are, am I a child of God? Is there a point in my life I can look to, and I was changed because I was born again? Well, I was baptized. I was No, no. Was there a time in your life that you were convicted, you confessed your sins, and you were born again? The old pastor, Pastor Berkey, I quote him a lot. He said, you can be born once and die twice, or you can be born twice and die once. Have you been born twice? Have you been born physically and spiritually? Deacon has to be saved, has to be, has to be saved. We need deacons who are serious about carrying out their office and being a servant of the church. What the church does not need are men who think they are God's gift to the church. Pastors and deacons. We have one gift in this church. His name is Jesus Christ. That's the only gift we need. The pastors and deacons of the church. You know what we are? We're lost people that have been redeemed by the blood of Christ who have a story to tell. And God's called us to tell that story. And to articulate on it. We don't have little dictators set up in the church. It's a, it, we, we do an open financial report. Where everybody can hear Every church member, everyone that's come and they're a member of Hallelujah Side Baptist Church has an equal vote. The men can't outvote, well, I, if you've got more, I guess. But the women's vote don't count less than the men's vote. You all have an equal 
vote within the church. Deacons support that. Those men who received the ordination as a deacon and discharged their duties in a proper way are promised in their, to be blessed in their spiritual walk. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. We're going to close there. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. If somebody could read that for me. They that have used the office of deacon well, purchased to themselves a good degree, and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Well, I love that scripture. I've been asked, and I've told this before, uh, they, they mean well by it. By, I've been asked this multiple times. Have you ever considered going into full-time ministry, meaning go to a church that would pay me, and it, it just burns me up. I, of course I'm in full-time ministry. God didn't call you to be a part-time preacher. Um, but whether you're at a church that pays you or don't pay you or whatever, I like this office about deacon because there's those promises for pastors as well. For they that have used the office of deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. Man, he's promised you blessings. So I can tell you from an eyewitness standpoint, I've been a deacon, uh, youth pastor, pastor, and all these different things. God has rich me, richly blessed me in those offices of sacrifice. Beyond, I mean, I could, I could keep you here all day and go story after story after story where he has blessed me and, and beyond my wildest, and, just, you know, and it's funny because he's not a genie in the bottle. You ever have that, the genie in the bottle prayer? Lord, I need you. Let me rub the bottle and let me, my three wishes come true. He just, I can't even explain it. He just provides. And he says this here, too, that it, the deacons that discharge their duties in a proper way, they're promised that they're going to be blessed in their spiritual walk. That goes beyond monetary compensation. We live in a world of anxiety and anxiety drugs. Being in Christ, you know what's amazing about that? And you're just worried about the day? about honoring him today, life gets simpler. And what I love this is people tell me, well, Scott, you've never suffered anxiety. Oh, yeah, I have. Been there. I've taken drugs for it. Drugs that I needed because it was a medical problem. But the best thing for me was to simplify things and being in, in the word and in God and in prayer and doing what he asked me to do gave me a peace that I couldn't get from the anxiety drugs. It helped me. It was the first place I should have went. I'm not telling you if you're on medication, it helps you with a, a medical problem and it's a true medical problem, not to take the medication, okay? Don't misconstrue it. But you should always look to Christ first. And what he's done is talking about this office of deacon, he promises to bless you. He gives you a peace that goes beyond what you understand. And you know what? Here's another news flash for you. You're going to go through bad times. You're all in here. You're old enough. I'm sure everybody's experienced death in your family. You experience health problems. He can give you a peace and a joy that is with you while you're going through those problems that's beyond you. It's great. He, he says it. The term, you know, the good that he says good degree that refers to respect. And deacons are served well, should be held in a high esteem of the people that they're serving. The coolest thing is when you're doing God's work is when people hold you in high esteem and respect and love. Because you can't put a price tag on that. Because you know what you're doing? You're doing something that's benefiting them and they're loving you back. And unless you ever take a step of faith in service for somebody, you'll never experience that. You know what that takes? It takes courage. Because you know what you got to do? You got to open yourself up. Well, why get hurt? You know what? You're going to get hurt anyway. But take a step of faith for him, and it's amazing the people he'll put into your life that will take up the slack. He does it. I'm living proof that he does it, that he provides. He provides in ways you'll never know. So I'm going to, I'll pick on Heath. We've been friends for 45 years. He's going to, he ain't going to believe me. I believe our friendship's really a gift from God. We're very close. And I've told this story about him. Let's say he went out and did something totally stupid. He never would. And somebody came to me and they were criticizing. I don't care what he did. He's my brother. I love him. I'm going to defend him. Yeah. Don't you talk bad about him. Now, I might go back to him and say, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? I'm not going to take sides against him. 
because he's my brother. I love him. I care about him. And doesn't mean, I, like I said, I wouldn't go back and whatever, but I'm not going to let somebody gossip about him. I got his back. The people of God should be that way. If you're doing something wrong, I shouldn't jump into the, you know, well, you, uh, Kathy deserves it. I shouldn't jump in the gossip. I need to defend her, but then I need to go to her and say, hey, what are you doing? It's our business. It's family business. Those relationships come through God. I really believe that. You don't stab your brothers and sisters in the back. Deacons are such a big part of that because they can be held in such a res uh, of their service of high esteem by people of the church. And he goes on and he says this in verse 13. Themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith. Don't know what he says. He doesn't say, well, to get this, you're going to have to be bold. He says this. For they have uh, used the office of deacon well, purchased to themselves a good degree, talking about respect, and great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. I believe what that's talking about. He gives you the boldness. It's funny because a lot of times people wonder, um, and Pastor Andrew's got a lot of good stories about door knocking and street preaching and all that. Boldness. Well, I don't think it started that way. I don't think he was that bold. But the, you know, when you try to conjure that up within yourself, it doesn't work. The boldness comes with, he, he tell, if you're faithful to the office I've given you, I'm going to give you respect. That's what the, good, the uh, um, good degree is. And I'm going to give you great boldness. He gives you the boldness. You don't have to conjure up anything. There's been times when I've stood up against things that I thought were absolutely wrong in the church, and I've told myself I'm not going to say a word. And she's laughing. And, and it just gets ridiculous, the road that may be going down that's ungodly, and I can't keep my mouth shut. It's a boldness. It's not of me. It's not even a popular opinion sometimes. And it's like, well, we can't do this. But he promises them a great boldness. This means that they can speak in truth and boldness because they're living a life they should and they're a blessing to the people of God. So that is it. Hi, my name is Pastor Andrew Tooney, and I would love to personally invite you to Hallelujah Side Baptist Church. We are a loving Christ-centered church located at 119 Valley Street in Old North Dayton. We are a local, independent, Baptist body of Christ, taking the gospel to our beloved city of Dayton, whose sole purpose is to bring glory to God in all that we do, standing alone on our sole authority of faith and practice, the King James Bible. We have a children's and adult Sunday school hour that starts at 10 a.m. We have a sanctified worship service that starts at 11 a.m. Our midweek prayer meeting starts at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening. We also have a nursery available for children three and under during both services. For more information, visit us at hsbc-dayton.com. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. God bless you.